Hello and welcome to ClassicJalopy.com. Today we're going to look at three very different engines all built within a couple of months of each other. We're going to look at three six-cylinder engines. The first one is this one from the Rover P5. Then we're going to have a look at the Mercedes-Benz mid-sized six-cylinder engine, in this case a M129 2.5 litre. And then finally we're going to look at Jaguar's XK engine. All three engines have a fundamentally different design philosophy, which isn't something you see in modern cars. So this one is the Rover P5 3 litre. This engine came out just after the Second World War in the Rover P3, starting at a 2.1 litre engine, and there were various capacities right up to this one, which is the 3 litre version, as found in the P5. The most well-known one of these was probably the 2.6 that you found in the P4, and as well as in various Land Rover models, and those Land Rover models were produced right up until the 80s. What's interesting about this engine is that it is, it's called an IOE engine, or intake over exhaust. So essentially it has an overhead intake valve and a side exhaust valve. And the reason for this was that Britain at the time had protectionist style tax law for cars. So you paid road tax based on what they call the fiscal horsepower of the engine, which was related to the bore size. So a lot of British engines of the time would have a long stroke and a small bore. So companies had to come up with innovative ways of getting valves big enough to allow the engines to breathe. And so Rover came up with this arrangement where it allowed them to have quite a large intake valve and then with the side exhaust valve it sort of gave them almost like an upside down hemispherical uh, combustion chamber with these very tall skinny valves. Now this engine, you can see down on the side here, where if I hold the light, where the side, you can open up this um, cover here and you could actually get to where the side valves are underneath that exhaust manifold. And then obviously the intake valves are at the top. This engine has a reputation of being a very smooth and refined engine. And even in this particular car, which is in great condition, it certainly is. Being a long stroke engine doesn't rev very hard, but it has a lot of torque from rest and it's incredibly smooth. And it actually suits the character of this car quite well in that it's a sort of a luxury car and more sedate. Later on, Rover offered the V8 in, in, in this particular car and probably overshadowed some of these six cylinders, but the six cylinder is a really interesting engine and, and one of the smoothest six cylinder motors of its time. The other interesting thing about this engine is how heavy it is. You know, when the V8 came out, it was so much lighter that the front suspension was um, not really as good because the, um, of all the weight that was taken off the front axle. So basically, this engine is quite torquey. It has this interesting arrangement with exhaust over intake. And because it's an older style engine, it's actually got provision for a starting handle as well. The next engine we're going to take a look at is the Mercedes-Benz engine. So this is the Mercedes-Benz M129 fuel injection engine. You can see here, if I point the light, this is the injection pump where you get the different um, fuel lines going into the engine and completely opposite to the Rover engine, this is a, a short stroke engine so it has a much bigger bore than a stroke and so consequently it doesn't have a lot of torque from rest but it revs really high and it, uh, it breathes a lot better. To get a bit of extra torque, Mercedes came up with this intake manifold design which uses sort of a ram air effect to get additional airflow into the engine at certain sort of mid RPM ranges as they were using this in a lot of big heavy sedans. This engine had its genesis in the M180 engine which came out again just after the Second World War and was ultimately used right up into the mid 80s although it probably had its most wide use through the, the 50s and 60s. The Rover engine that we saw before was sort of producing around 100, I think about 134 gross horsepower. And this engine is rated at 170 gross horsepower or 150 net. So because it revs much higher, it has higher horsepower, although it has a lower torque figure.
um, the, the characteristics are very different. In this engine, you really keep the revs up and you use the ability of the transmission in these cars to sort of change it yourself, even though it's an automatic, uh, because it performs much better at sort of four or 5,000 RPM, whereas the Rover engine is much happier at, at lower RPM ranges. The fuel injection on this car also helps with its output and capacity. The, the equivalent carbureted models were quite a bit lower in power than this fuel injected model. So while the, um, the capacity is smaller, it's actually putting out more power than the three liter Rover engine, even though this one's only a, a two and a half liter. Like the Rover engine, this, this is a very smooth engine. I've, I personally feel it fits the character of these cars better than the, the later V8s that came out, even though the V8s are the ones that, that the collectors always want. I think the V8s work better in the later cars. And um, while it has you know, a lot of very high-tech stuff for its day in terms of the fuel injection, the fundamental design is a overhead cam engine, um, but it's not a cross-flow head. So both you can see here, both the intake and the exhaust are on this side. But it was a very efficient engine for its size and certainly the, the fuel injection helped as well and, and gave quite good performance. This, this engine isn't related specifically to some of the larger engines used in things like the Gullwing and so on, but it was the sort of mainstream six-cylinder motor used throughout most of the 60s in sort of mid-sized Mercedes-Benz passenger cars. The final engine we're going to look at today is the Jaguar XK. So this is the 4.2 litre version. Uh, the, this engine again came out not long after the Second World War and it was originally a 3.4 that was used in the XK120 and the C-Type and the D-Type. And then later an, a 3.8 version was used um, and then ultimately this 4.2. They also made a shorter stroke um, 2.4 and then 2.8 versions which weren't nearly as powerful as these larger ones. Uh, this engine, again, because of the British tax laws, is also a long stroke motor, but Jaguar used a dual overhead cam system to, again, angle the valves in the head and get the biggest possible valves they could into this system. And then they used a triple carburetor setup, as you can see here, to try and get as much fuel into the, the engine as possible. It's actually quite interesting having a dual overhead cam setup on somewhat quite a low revving engine but it did allow the engine to breathe reasonably well. And being a long stroke engine, it had, again, a lot of power from rest, but the um, dual overhead cams also allows it to breathe better than, say, the Rover engine. So it makes quite a lot of power. This one, while Jaguar claimed 265 gross horsepower, they, they never really made that stuff, that sort of power in reality. And so it's probably somewhere around 190, 200 net maybe 210, 220 gross, something like that. But it's, it's an incredibly powerful motor for its day and certainly won a lot of races in the, in the C-type and, and the D-type. And this triple carburetor setup is probably the, um, the definitive version of it as used in the, the E-type and in the, the Mark 10 and, and, and so on. Um, it also works quite well with the manual transmission of, of the cars we looked at today. This is the only one with a manual um, and you can you know, extract a lot more power from it when you drive these behind some of the older automatics of the time. You sort of harder to get the engine to breathe and develop as, you know, get the right revs as you can um, with the manual. The Jaguar version of the engine is probably the best known because of, of its racing history and it was used right up in the early 90s, at least in some Daimler limousines and so on, as well as being the mainstream engine of the XJ6, the Mark IIs, S-Types and all those other quite famous Jaguars um, throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s and, and, and even up and through the 80s.